I'll start with Amy Blackman. Uh, Amy Blackman, I manage band, and I am on the board of ATC and Music Cares, and one of the bands I manage is Ozo Motley. They're going to be speaking next. Um, they are an activist band, both working inside the system as State Department cultural ambassadors as well as outside, you know, having a, a rich history of participating in grassroots uh, organization, activism, um, protests, and some jail time, and um, <laughs> and that's okay. Um, but you know, I I come to this conference and and will from here on out. Last year was my first year because this was a place that I found like-minded people who were working in this industry, um, not just to find a way for their artists to make money, but f for their artists careers and legacies to have greater social impact and meaning. So I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity um, to come here and learn something. Hi, my name is Brian Calhoun. I am uh, Vice President of New Media and External Affairs at Sound Exchange. I'm also on the Board of Directors at uh, the Future of Music Coalition. And uh, in uh, my little spare time that I have, I uh, also do a little bit of uh, consulting. I work with uh, some artists and managers to kind of help them uh, navigate sort of the uh, new music industry, especially with respect to uh, their digital properties. Uh, there, I mean, there's so much that could be said about the, the conference. And one thing that I was thinking about as we were discussing it in the, uh, in, in the green room is that there's you know, there's all the stuff that we talk about, you know, you see people talking about on the panels, but there is so much stuff that goes on like outside, like in the, in the lobby too. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that's one of the really big uh, uh, assets of, this, of, the, of the conference is the, the conversations that you get to have in depth with people like outside of, the, uh, outside of this and like at the reception last night and stuff. So that's been great. And I, I tweeted something about the, uh, about the, about the uh, conference earlier, uh, I joined Sound Exchange three years ago this month, and I had no idea three years ago that so much of the music industry uh, discussion would be about data, right? And, you know, when I first started coming to the Future of Music conference like eight years ago, um, it, it was really the first time I started hearing about the, these conversations about data. And it's just really great to see, I mean, that, I mean, that's one of the great things about uh, FMC in the, in the conference is that although there are many more conferences that have, um, you know, that have sort of doing some things to sort of replicate uh, or do their version of what uh, FMC does, uh, I, this, this conference always is like the leader to me with, with, with these types of discussions. So, my brief thoughts. Anna. Um, my name is Anna Chalenza. I'm a professor here at Georgetown University. And the first thing I want to say from me and from my students is thank you for being here. Uh, when I have students come and they're thinking about going to Georgetown, and they're interested in music and in media and, and all of these sorts of issues, they say, well, why should I get to Georgetown? And I'm like, because future music comes to Georgetown. Um, <laughs> so it's, and that kind of leads into one of the issues that's really spoken to me the last couple of days, and that's the sense of community. Because we've talked about community in a lot of different ways. Of course, we're a community, and we see each other every year, and it's a, that it's a great experience. There's also this sense of, um, there's that virtual community out there, and we've heard from folks about how can you join it, how can you be a part of it, how can your voice be louder in it. But uh, another point that really spoke to me today was uh, Larissa Mann was talking about but how can we make sure we don't lose that person-to-person, -person, real life community, and, and that we realize we do live in a place, and we do need to connect with those things? Um, and I think this conversation and this meeting really helps us do that, and that's one of the things I've taken away so far. Thanks, Anna. Rebecca. Um, my name is Rebecca Gates. I'm a musician. Um, I also work in non-musical sound art projects as a curator and editor, and I'm a musician advocate working on uh, helping preserve the sustainability of a musician's culture and also activate musicians to sustain their local and national cultures. I also served as a consultant on the Artist Revenue Stream Survey that FMC is uh, conducting currently. And uh, I know that probably everybody in this room has already taken the survey if you're eligible for it, but I would like to take this moment to the room here and anyone on the web that if you're a musician, please go to the website and take the survey. And if you could tell a musician or three 
Uh, the survey will be online till the end of the month, and we're just trying to gather as much data and as many stories from musicians as we can. So um, the conference for me is always uh, thrilling and overwhelming. There's a lot of intelligent people that have a lot of expertise, and that's something I find incredibly exciting. There's also a lot of dedication in the room. And uh, so I, I leave slightly overwhelmed and also very inspired. One of the things uh, at the risk of just sort of being a musician, talking about uh, the role of the musician in music, which I seem to be uh, talking a lot about these days, is that uh, I think that one of the reasons we're all here is because of music, and we live in a world where technology is so overwhelming and so ingrained, and, and this, con this conference is a lot about data, and I think a lot about industry, and it's the future of music business, and I think that that's something that is, is valid and, and should not be disregarded, but I think that Having uh, music, we're here because of music. We're not here because we're trying to sell shoes or because we're trying to sell physical objects. Music translates into a ones and zeros, and it's hard to be articulate about it because there's so many different threads that were introduced, but I think that I've been really inspired by people who are doing advocacy on behalf of musicians. Uh, I was really impressed with uh, a quote from... Um, Mr. Goodlatte, I still don't know how to say his name correctly, yeah, yeah. is that right? Where, uh, where he was talking about music as intellectual property and that people making intellectual property that needs to be protected and that if we don't protect it in some way that it's going to reduce the culture and reduce the uh, commitment to making that in, in, in the way that we're used to in a way that could possibly be more, that could be vibrant and continue to contribute to culture. Uh, so that's just something I think that uh, I was talking to Aaron McCallan a lot of, uh, today, and I think that I could just muse for hours and I won't, but um, to think in terms of the shifting power structure and all the options that are available to us currently with technology, to not just translate an old structure of labels into a current structure of tech that is built on the backs of music is really important. I think that we all care too much about it and there's a lot of innovative ways that we could look at it and I hope that continues to happen with this group. Peter, Peter Gordon. Ah, hard one to follow, very nice. <laughs> I'm Peter Gordon, I have uh, what was once known as a record label. Uh, we're in an identity crisis now, we're trying to figure out what that means. Uh, I've also been involved in a number of trade organizations, and now I'm co-founder of the Jazz Forward Coalition, which is uh, working on the fronts of advocacy and infrastructure to uh, expand the uh, cultural footprint of jazz. So we're very excited about that and working with FMC. And, and, and of course, coming here is, you know, it's just your mind is lubricated with all these ideas, thoughts, and passions, and, and, and a lot of points of confusion, too, and, and, um, and some, some that uh, Rebecca illuminated, not that she's confused, but some points of confusion. Um, she's confused. And, and, and some of those is this, this kind of uh, current trick bag, uh, which is kind of the, the promise of um, broadband and internet, the, that, that we've smashed through these sort of, uh, these barriers, a barrier of entry and access to market, and it seems like the world is at our oyster now. And on and one hand, it's, it's, it's kind of a delicious thought, and on the other hand, it's a delusional thought at the same time. Because by doing that, we've also created this huge traffic jam of people going to the same place and created a kind of a gridlock to kind of get a piece of it. And something that was in, a, uh, was in an internal meeting talking about, if you want to think about today, you shouldn't think about today, you should think about five years from now. I think that was Peter Jenner. And if we think about where we want to be five years from now versus today, and, and technology forces you to think about the now, the current, the present, what's going to happen tomorrow, can I get a piece of it, I don't want to miss at it, and take the longer view, you can kind of relax in what kind of decisions you want to make. And the, the ultimate decision I think we need to make here and protect and preserve, not only an intellectual property and this and that, is two basic things. One thing that Rebecca touched on is the integrity of the artists and the artistic process, and not to just go for a mass market penetration. Because if you take that integrity away, you take away the specialness of music. We take away the specialness of music, 
we're just you know apples just sitting on a cart somewhere we're just a commodity and so the technology doesn't deliver that for us technology can strip mine that from us if, if we're not careful of that and the other thing and it's often been a theme in future of music is how do we protect and how do we guide and how do we channelize to have a robust uh, middle class for musicians and if we don't have that as a sustainable model just like the middle class in the economy we we only have entry level and those that have succeeded and if we take the middle out we, we then rot from the middle forward. So I think that becomes a very big part of our mission now that we have those, those tools that we can hand in. Thanks. Thanks. Burtis. So uh, I'm Burtis Downs. I've had one job my whole life, pretty much. <laughs> that book, My Life Could, My Band Could Be Your Life or something, I'm, yeah, you know, I can relate to that. And now it's not, but there's still, you know, I guess I still have something to do. I'm uh, probably, we're putting the greatest hits out and I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna teach, I guess, some more at the law school at University of Georgia where I've taught off and on since I graduated there 30 years ago. Um, I come to Future Music partly to become optimistic because um, in the face of, uh, you know, change and turbulence and all the things going on in the world, in the age of free, where kids like free stuff, uh, in the age where it's the everything that matters, the access to everything more than any one thing. I, somebody in this room probably coined it, so I'm sorry I can't give you a source, but it's just the greatest quote. Uh, it's conversation, um, content is no longer king. Content isn't king, it's just something to have a conversation about. <laughs> content is now just a little thing for people to retweet and talk about and pass around and you know, it's worth about that. To, to a lot of people. So I like to stay optimistic because I'm generally an optimistic person. I come to Future Music to be infused by the enthusiasm of others and hear stories about how it's working out for others and kind of hold in my mind the, you know, the, the theory of copyright, the theory of protection of intellectual property versus seeing how it's playing out versus then going to these data panels that are always over my head but that I do glean something from in terms of understanding you got to be able to enumerate and keep tabs on things in order for those little micro payments to ever add up to a career which is sort of the point for a lot of us. Thank you. Uh, I, you know so what we do at Future Music is so we get to the conference and then we're going to run around and do a bunch of meetings tomorrow and then we're going to cry and then we'll get together and then we'll try to figure out what happened and then we'll wait for the webcast to get on uh, the archive so we can actually watch the conference because we actually miss a lot of you know, big chunks of it. But um, part of I think what's been bubbling up internally over the last couple of days, uh, certainly uh, what, what I've been you know, really thinking about is the connection really between the local conversation. I thought the local infrastructure panel is spectacular this year. I thought it was really great. Um, and I think the connection between Local needs, and I really appreciate what, what Peter Gordon said, uh, you know, about the kind of the middle class of musician, which is a, a label we've kind of gotten away from the last couple of years, but I think is a core concept in his new lexicon. But the idea of sustaining career, sustaining a livelihood, sustaining a community, and connecting that back up to the federal. And, and I thought, you know, uh, obviously, you know, we, we feel pretty strongly about uh, about Michael Copps, and I think one of the the lessons that a lot of people have learned over the last three or four years is that elections are not governing. You know, elections are kind of fun and they're charismatic and they're deadlines and there's a winner and a loser and you have events and you have rallies and then it's over. And then governing is different. You know, it's a slog, it's day-to-day, -day, it's incremental. And it's so hard to kind of be in the middle of governing and trying to move policy and really have a sense of are you winning or are you losing? Are your champions fighting for you? Have you been sold out? And, you know, I think when, when, when then you take that local conversation and think about federal, and of course we focus more on federal, we don't get too much in state and local policy, but think about the fact that, again, there are all these extremely significant policy decisions that get made. We always talk about radio. You know, radio is fundamentally a very conscious policy decision, a series of them, that allowed for consolidation, that limited the amount of non-commercial radio stations, you know, and now it's going the other way uh, in terms of allowing the expansion of low-power radio um, and, uh, you know, hopefully building that infrastructure. We'll see what happens with, with NPR funding, which is something we haven't touched on too much this week. Um, I wonder if, um, I saw some nodding heads. I don't know if anybody's got anything to jump in on specifically on, on what you all said. Um, I don't know, were you looking at me, Amy, saying I want the microphone? <laughs> no, I just, you know, I, I, Burtis, you just summed up exactly what I was thinking and I didn't know how to put into words, but, um, you know, listening to these guys earlier um, so passionately debate how to collect um, 
you know, these micro amounts of money, sound exchange and, you know, um, Jim Griffin and, every, you know, he's, I mean, he's, yeah. um, and, <laughs> and it, you know, for, for me as a manager, and, and I, I say this actually optimistically, I've thrown up my hands with that stuff, but I'm really grateful that there are people out there that really care about it. Um, because we are talking about small amounts of money that add up to a lot of money, but I um, had been, I guess by necessity, forced to think about different opportunities and different ways to get my artists' music out there through pretty unconventional partnerships and means, you know, be it we're working with governments or we're working with chefs or we're working with comedians, like we're doing all kinds of things that aren't making records and going on tour and collecting your royalty checks um, and finding a way to have a career, but it is really heartening to me that um, there are people that are so committed and putting so much time and thought into this and feel that it, it is important and it, it does sort of reinvigorate me that there, I have to split my focus a little bit because that is really important. So thank you for, for bringing that up. And I want to ask you, so we, this is the 10th year of the conference, which means that some of the students that you have now were probably in third or fourth grade. The first time that we had, you know, Orrin Hatch here. And at, I wasn't at, here. At, you weren't here. But no. I wasn't in third or fourth grade either. No, no, you're students. <laughs> I was much older, you're unfortunately. You're students. You're students, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. The students yeah, are teaching no. now. Yeah, yeah, no. And so, you're, you know, you, you, you have kind of multiple generations of growing up with technology, and they think about these questions in ways that are hard for people my age to conceive of. And I'm wondering if you can speak to kind of what you're perceiving as far as people who are coming to school, want to work in music, they want to work in culture. You know, I, what are you getting from them? Are, are you picking up anything from them that's interesting? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, we talk about the future of music, and the future of music is not us, it's the generation that's younger than us and the generation before that. And I think one of the things, um, education is a big, important part of policy. And it, the education, the arts, you know, people talk about it getting cut, but, you know, we're all in this room. And one of the things that I've noticed, and I thank those of you who have talk to students, I've gotten emails from my students saying, oh yeah, I saw this person and he talked to me or she talked to me about this or that. I, we can't say this is how you prepare someone to have a music profession anymore. It, that, you know, that used to happen 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was sort of this, there were books, there was a, a model to follow and there's not anymore. So I do think what we need to think about is how do we prepare the next generation? We can't just say do A, B and C and that's going to happen. Um, so I think a lot of it is about uh, you know, opening up conversations, creating communities, because the, the, the virtual world can be a very isolating place, and that's why I brought up the issue of community. And I think that for all of us it can be isolating, which maybe is one of the reasons why an event like this is so important. Um, but even more than that, I, I do think we need to, to talk about and think about, and I would love to hear from the audience, because from what, what I've heard from my students uh, who have been to this conference the last few years, uh, is that their best education is sort of seeing in things in action, and their success is coming from thinking, what's it gonna be like in five years, not what's it like right now? And I thought that was an incredibly important point. I think what's interesting is if one of the first sort of you know, disruptive elements of the digital transformation was the sort of notion of global distribution, you know, at an instant and the ability to kind of find your people globally in ways that were never before conceivable. It feels in some ways that it's going back the other way in terms of hyper-local. And you see a lot more of local, you know, focus on communities and on local organizing, trying to build those structures. I don't know if, I know, Rebecca, you're doing some thinking around Portland. I know Peter, I see you nodding a little bit. You, any of you want to reflect on that? Is that something you're feeling? Or Amy, you know, certainly. Well, <laughs> this is kind of funny. Full disclosure, um, yesterday I had an opportunity to leave the, you know, National Music Summit and go to the National Food Summit to hear the <laughs> keynote speech of Chef Jose Andres. And it was fascinating because he said something that really blew my mind, which was, um, you know, because of, uh, corn subsidies, feeding the um, process, you know, the agribusiness which creates processed food, that it's actually the rich farms feeding the poor, and then it's the um, poor farmers which are the, you know, the small micro farms that feed the farmers markets that feed the rich because the poor can't afford to shop there. And I thought, you know, applying that to, um, 
the conversations that are happening here about the right. community and the micro and how important that is, yeah. you know, and, and there was, um, I don't know, it, it just struck me as that's the main thing that I'm, I'm taking away from this, you know, the, 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 the shifting back to thinking small mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, not just in this industry, but sort of in, in our culture and our society overall. So I, I just wanted to share that because I, you know, it, <laughs> everyone I mentioned it to that I was going to the food summit was like, that's cool, you know, all the music <laughs> people. But yeah, yeah, it was that, across town. That and sounds it was like really a, interesting. Yeah, a, a better conference. Is that what you're saying, Amy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Rebecca or Peter, do you want to chime in on this question of local and kind of building that infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, sometimes you have to go old school to go new school, yeah. and sometimes you kind of forget, you get kind of seduced by the future, but you, you forget about the good lessons of the past. And I think, uh, I, I don't know if REM, you didn't start global dominance, I take it? Absolutely, you started local and pretty much stayed local. You stayed local, and kind of the reward, the end of the rainbow was you found a global alliance that, that bought into what you're doing. But that was not, you know, eight years later. But eight years later, yeah. And, and the, the whole point of music is it's a connective tissue within the communities, which we're talking about, that it brings a lot of people together, industries together. Uh, a, a band that plays is also working with uh, the person who's making the flyers of the local radio station, is selling the drinks. It's, the whole ecosystem is there, and it's a multiplier effect as, as a real uh, integral part of the cultural economy. And, you know, we forget the main body of work that creates excitement about music is, is word of mouth. I mean, you, you can't manufacture that. You can try to sell it in, and certainly the major labels have tried to sell it in a million times. Um, and certainly I don't think REM was the result of being sold in by a major label. They may have facilitated a larger marketplace, but I think you had to do the work first, and they could expand upon that. I was actually, I, when Mike asked us to think about this conference, I started thinking about the first conference I went to when I was a law student in 1981 at Georgia State. You know, you know, auditorium about like this, not as good a crowd. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I didn't, either I knew as much as I know now, or I didn't know anywhere near as much, but it was the same exact issues. How do you get people to care about your music? How, do you make good music? And then how do you get people to care about your music? And then how do you somehow piece that together into a career? Those are still exactly the same issues we're talking about at conferences now. A lot of different tools, a lot of different ways of going about that, but it's still that same core you know, connection with the fan, getting people to care, getting people to want to start a conversation around what you're doing. That's it. That's and, and, and it can be a little delusional in terms of the technology that's available yeah. to us. And that especially now. Yeah. Especially now. And, you, and uh, it's also, we've, we've kind of cam cannibalized the process because of the, the ease of, of involvement, which is difficult. So people feel you can skip steps. But you really can't skip steps, can you? It's really a one at a time situation until you multiply over time. So that's an important basic value never to lose sight of, which is all local. Can I, can I just add one thing to that? Um, you, had, you had made the comment about, you know, you want to make good music and, and you want to, to, to get it out there, and, and which of, of course we want to do that, or, or when you, you make good music and because you care. I think one piece that gets lost sometimes in this is not just connecting with audiences in that letting them experience the music, but there are a lot of audience members out there that really care about music too, and is there a way that they can be a part of the system that's not just about as a consumer? And I think when you can tap into letting the people that aren't, you know, as my dad says, I play the radio, so tapping into the person that plays the radio in a way that they feel like they're making a difference besides just being a consumer. I just want to add something uh, with respect to uh, education. Um, uh, the Artist Revenue Streams project that uh, the Future of Music Coalition is working on, I, I, I think there are some people, it's interesting when I talk to people about it, I'll see some people and they get it right away, like how important this study is. But w when we start talking about like, you, you know, your students and, and, you know, what is their career path look like, you know, I don't know. I mean, everybody, everybody up here has had a different career path. And, you know, everybody that I talk to in the music industry has had a different career path. But I think that, the, you know, this particular study is going to be able to help guide some people a little bit because it's so interesting. You know, I, I remember at my first FMC, uh, Peter Jenner was on a panel and they were talking about 
you know, all the different ways that artists make money. And I was like, well, how much as a percentage do, do your bands make from these different things? And it was Peter and it was a number of other people on the panel. I asked the question and everybody kind of looked at each other and like, you know, were perplexed. I, you know, they, nobody really had, had, had this answer. So it makes it a little bit difficult to try to figure out where you want to focus your energies. But this study, I think, uh, you know, as we saw in uh, you know, we saw some of the stuff up here. It's got a preview of what it's going to look like. I think is going to help frame people's um, uh, uh, initiatives and, and their areas of focus. So I'm, I'm really, really stoked about it. That's great. Now we are um, we're all incredibly excited about it. I think we're moderately terrified to actually release the data and see where the conversation <laughs> goes, just because it's going to be. You know, it's a real study, you know, and, and, and part of that is flying without a, a net and just kind of seeing where it goes. And, um, you know, I think we've made abundantly clear. I mean, this is the beginning of the conversation. This is not anywhere close to the end of the conversation. But, uh, you know, Gene and Kristen and the rest of the team are doing a pretty amazing job, I think, of, of getting it out there. And hopefully folks are taking the survey. Um, I know the response has been pretty tremendous so far. So we're excited about it. And, and I do think, I mean, from my very, you know, so I look at this from policy lens, right? I mean, that's kind of my piece of this. And you know, to tie that bit back. I think when policymakers are able to see the realities of how money flows in this economy, but then you think about sort of the day-to-day -day livability issues and sustainability for musicians, and you're like, okay, well, how much are you paying for health care? Um, you know, how much, you know, what's going on through transportation issues? What's going on with, with uh, you know, schools and, and your kids? You know, the basic things that are important to anybody living in this country, you know, but then in the context of how revenue is flowing to musicians is, is going to be, you know, really eye-opening. Bertus? I have a... I have a um anecdotal thing to share with you from Ed Pearson. A lot of people in this room probably know Ed. He's, he couldn't be here this year. He lives in Seattle, former general counsel at Warner Chapel. He just sent me a thing, I don't know, over a couple hours ago. I don't think he knew I was going to be in D.C. But he said, if Spotify's rate requires 3,461 streams for the artist being streamed to buy a cup of coffee, that would mean 1,245,793 streams on Spotify in order for the artist lawyer to buy a sandwich. And I... <laughs> I think Ed, Ed's pretty good at math, and I told him I was going to use this at the conference and give him due credit. So that's, that's Ed Pearson at gmail.com. Um, but Ed is pretty good at math, but he does make a really important point, and that's the point I've been really struggling with. And one of the reasons I come to Future Music is so that I can understand how, with the Spotify's of the world and the RDOs and the turntable FMs and these various sort of, sort of licenses that are being, in, the ones that are licensed, um, if we're... If, if the copyright used to mean, and the system used to be, that there'd be a limited number of choices, which wasn't necessarily good, but that's what it was, and people would pay a relatively lot of money for that, and that all be divided up, eventually, hopefully some of it got back to some of the artists. What about a world where everything's available, hardly anybody's paying anything for it, something just tells me, as Jay Cooper once said one of these things, the math's just not gonna work out. How's the math ever gonna work out? If you're, if you're dividing the pie up that finely, and there's so little revenue actually coming in because people are getting, you know, other than the premium users, they're getting it for free. And there's these rev shit, you know, there's all these various ways of doing it. But the bottom line is that's the kind of numbers it takes to add up to a cup of coffee for an artist. And is that going to add up to that sustainable, whatever you want to call it, middle class of musicians that we all are striving for and, and, and hope to replace what the, kind of the bad old days with something better? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think obviously it's too early to know, but... It's one reason to have this conference and be able to talk about that. Right. I think that one of the things I was thinking about when Erin was, uh, was on the panel yesterday and was asked by the gentleman from Move, like, well, if she didn't like the models that were being offered in terms of Spotify's Moves, Crickets, you know, Turntable FM, what did she want it to look like? Well, she was really on the spot. I think she came back with a great, great response. But I was thinking, how would I answer that question? And one of the things that I would say is that one of the things is that there's these companies that are using music as, uh, as their content, their orientation, and they're monetizing their position. They're positioning themselves, they're getting VC capital, and they're making sure that they can transfer. I'm not saying that people shouldn't do business. I'm actually think. I mean, that's a different conversation, but I think that what I would say to him is, well, will you put musicians in your line? Like when you're talking to your VC funders and when you're thinking about shareholders, will you also just put musicians in and not think in terms of like a very small percentage of being paid some license fee that you've negotiated with rights holders who increasingly don't represent musicians such as myself and many other people who are working? Um, how, 
can you just at least do that? You know, can you, can, and, and that way you're, you're actually saying, we're part of this ecosystem, you are part of that ecosystem. We wouldn't even have a business if you weren't doing your work. So how can we help you do that work? And I think that that's a, an issue that's coming up a lot, is just the sustainability of the culture overall, on a local level, on a federal level, on a cultural level, which is fascinating. So I was going to say, I'm, do you, uh, I'm going to the mic. I'd like to go ahead and, and bring uh, everybody else into this conversation. I mean, really what we're looking for are reflections over the last couple of days, uh, what you're feeling, what you're thinking. Um, hopefully, you know, maybe some questions. Uh, we can put these guys on the spot to see if they have any, anything they want to, uh, you know, answer, reflect on. Uh, well, I'm sort of over here with Aaron. Sorry to grab, is this on? Sorry to grab the mic again, but I'm wondering if the panelists have ideas for different metrics other than dollars to measure the success of their individual bands or projects or um, careers. Um, and, and I'm asking because there, this is a weird example, but a bunch of people who care about how young Jews engaged in Jewish life realized that the metrics that they, that they were using, you know, Jews marrying Jews, Jews going to high holidays and being members of synagogues and a fervent love of Israel were declining. And then they, they did a bunch of activities and found that actually young Jews cared about other things to, and they felt Jewish in other ways, so Shabbat and other things. And when they looked at, when they changed their metrics, they realized there was actually a flourishing um, or a revival of young Jews feeling Jewish in America. And I'm wondering if we're in the music industry looking at the wrong metrics maybe um, to measure our success. And I'm wondering what other metrics you might have in your careers or your bands. I think I said this last year, but I'm gonna bust it again. Um, <laughs> that I think um, SoundScan is about as relevant as SAT scores are to intelligence. And, you know, that, I mean, you talk about an out-of-date metric um, and that we don't even have the capability or the technology to measure downloads versus full album sales accurately, but yet a band very much in, in the world that I live in is still judged on what their sound scan number is um, to be granted opportunities such as getting on tours or getting sponsorships, you know, getting deals, getting opportunities, um, you know, that it's not really quantifiable, but my, my metrics, and they're pretty anecdotal, would be um, diversity of opportunities that are presenting itself outside of that traditional structure. So who is interested in my band outside of a radio station or... Um, a retailer, or, you know, mm -hmm. is it um, school kids? Is it uh, a nonprofit that wants to use their music for a PSA that they created? Is it, um, you know, a, a TV show that's interested in them composing an end title theme for it? You know, whatever that is, it's, you know, those are the ways that I measure success now as opposed to those, those metrics that are, are so out of date that I find them insulting actually that, you know, because bands are still penalized for not having those numbers and denied opportunities. I, I would add that, uh, you know, increasingly, uh, you know, you hear, uh, about, you know, sponsors are curious to know about number of Twitter followers and likes on Facebook and your the number of email addresses that you have and what your open rate is and click-through rate on your emails and so forth. And all of those things are definitely important. Um, and you know, there's certainly companies like Big Champagne and Next Big Sound that measure all types of, uh, of, of metrics, uh, uh, you know, which again, you know, success for one is different than a success for, for another. But ultimately, you know, when I talk to managers, the biggest measure of success is how much money are you making? You know, how much money are, is, the, is the manager able to uh, help their client, client make, you know, regardless of whether it comes from, you know, sales or it comes from touring or it comes from, you know, doing corporate gigs or whatever it is. At the end of the day, I mean, that's, you know, I think the, the core job of the manager is to that the biggest measure of success is how much money are you able to make, you, you'd help them make. And of course there are bands and you know, artists that have a lot of other things that they're interested in, but you know, 
you, you can do other things if you're making money. If you're not making money, it's really hard to do other things. Um, can I just uh, yeah, add please. one thing? The, uh, the, uh, I came from the independent world and, and now more involved in the jazz world, which has a different set of metrics uh, uh, in that jazz has a, a real longevity to it. Uh, you have jazz artists that are 18, you have jazz artists that are 95. Uh, almost an inverse respect where the older you are, you've survived, we honor you. The younger you are, you've got to pay your dues and when you're just about ready to kick, we'll start to honor you. But uh, one, one of the great measures of success for, for our artists is um, how they're measured by their peers and how their peers see them as having success and whether they've, they've reached that status of respect internally from the people they're most concerned about, um, which are, are the different musicians um, and the media people and the professionals around them, and they know where they stand in that area. That doesn't buy that cup of coffee or that sandwich, but it, it certainly keeps them encouraged to go on and, and move on, and, and, and that's, that's an important part of inspiration for an artist that's often just crawling on their belly. And if I can add to that, I mean, I think something you're, you, one does notice in um, younger generations now is I, I think there's a trend towards that and that success is that you are, you're having a way, and, and technology has helped this. You can, you can put your stuff out there and you can see that people are looking at it and watching it. So, um, you know, Charles Ives, a very famous American composer, he is, he was an insurance salesman. That's how he made his living and he's one of the most famous American classical composers that we have. So I, I don't feel like the, you have to make money from something to consider yourself a great success. And I think there are a lot of people out there who call themselves writers, who call themselves musicians, um, not because they are making money from doing it, but because that's really how they identify as their self. And I think one thing we need to do is, is respect that if we're you know, looking, listening to or reading what they have to say. Thank you, Rebecca. I just have, it's, it's a little, it's almost off point, but one of the things, thinking in terms of the future, and um, one, I think that I had a really interesting experience this summer, and it talks up, it, I was t talking on cultural economies up at Mass Mocha Museum, and um, where there was a group of people there, and there was a group of students who had come down from Bennington. So they were 18 and 19 years old. And as we sort of got further and further into this open table discussion, at one point I said, you know, it's one of, in terms of why, why should I think that I should make a living as a musician? You know, there's, maybe that's just something that's a fallacy. And even though I'm working hard and my work is valued culturally and people use it every day, that I shouldn't be compensated for that. And travel agents went sort of, you know, the way of the dodo bird with technology and maybe I'm just next. And I, you know, it shouldn't really matter to me and that we, end of it and this 18 year old raised his hand and he said I just don't think that a travel agent has the same cultural importance as music he says when I wake up in the morning I'm not thinking about my trip or my travel agent I have a song in my head and I think that that's a really dominant narrative that happens which is young people don't buy music young people aren't involved in their community young people don't have this uh, the old values they aren't going to treasure their community of people are making music and and um, I think that that's actually something we need to smash and open up and let them uh, exhibit for themselves I, I think the um, other thing that Aaron's question gets at is I think you, you are seeing particularly in kind of a s social media world where more and more of the younger bands that we work with part of the value that they get of being musicians is the ability to take that platform and take that network to engage in social activism and feel like they're contributing so it's almost a, you know, a quasi-activist or citizenship isn't the right thing, but it's, it's sort of a civic engagement uh, around issues or charities or film, you know, philanthropy, and the ability to sustain the career and keep doing it on the monetary side is great, and, they, and that's a big thing for them, but the real driver is the ability to do this other work. Um, let's go to some more questions. This is great. Thank you. Hello, my name is Olu Yamisi, and actually I want to deal with the matrix. I think money can never be excluded from the matrix just for the fact that a lot of us, at least the artists I know, have worked on their craft from the time they were young and developed it, and it's a scarce resource, a good artist in any field, and I, I don't think we go and... We assume when we hear someone's a doctor or a lawyer, we ask them, what's your day job? We don't do that because we assume they're making money off of what they're doing because we have a value we place on that. And I feel we need to always 
make sure there's a good value that we replace, we place on whatever kind of artist that you are, just for the fact that um, it is something that has been developed and is valuable. And uh, to say something, just because we're doing something that seems like it's enjoyable does not mean that we shouldn't have a paycheck to continue developing those songs or that artwork that we do. And I just felt that that needs to go out there. Um, Matrix, as so far as um, money, um, and also how many times you've been asked to perform versus how many times you have performed, how many fans you have, this is how we monetize ourselves. I cannot afford to stay in this field and just say, well, I'm having a good time doing it. I've been doing this for almost 11 years, and definitely I'm looking for checks to come in the mail. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Uh, in an afternoon of tributes, I just want to add one more. The, uh, you talked about, uh, Anne, about education. Uh, I want uh, to make a tribute to uh, Professor Burtis Downs. <laughs> I was a student in his, his very first class as a professor. Right, let me know, Steve. <laughs> and, and, and he inspired me, uh, you know, to, to become an activist in the music community. I've spent uh, 30 years in the business and given away uh, more, uh, 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 more services than I ever was paid for, and it was because of him and REM who inspired me to do that. And, you know, we're talking about money now, but you know, the power of music and the people in music to inspire others to do good in their communities is also a very powerful and important thing. Thanks. I'll also say, Steve, you proved that um, writing teachers can't really teach anybody to write. They just take good writers and tell them they're pretty good, and then the other writers, they just do the best they can with. You were a pretty good writer 30 years ago. I'm sure you still are. Um, I'm Christiana, and I'm... Uh, an artist and a musician and my day job is I work at the Arts Council and this is my second year here and what I'm hearing as a model for success is the artist fan relationship and utilizing technology to make that experience uh, easy easier and um, a beautiful thing but I think to be a successful musician there's you have to develop a lot more relationships that need to be positive. There's a relationship with the venue owner, the promoter, um, the graphic designer. There are a lot other relationships that uh, I think we're not talking about that we need to connect with. Well, uh, can find somebody. I, you know, I just want to mention something, Burris. You're talking about kind of the challenges of splitting up this incredibly tight pie and. Something that you know a number of us were talking about uh, earlier, um, we're reminded from from last year's summit. I don't know if any of you had a chance to see the uh, interview with T Bone Burnett, um, and, and T Bone got kind of picked on a little bit for some of the statements he made. But one of the things that I heard him say, and I think you know, maybe with T Bone it's rushed him on a little bit, and you're not sure. People hear different things from whatever he says, but um, this whole notion of emerging artists thinking about kind of MP3 and kind of the internet as we think of it as purely a promotional device and just give up on monetizing that. That, that you know, in this current economy, talk about you know, in a Spotify world, it can, you can build your base, build your visibility, build awareness, but then you've got to figure out how to then take that as a community and figure out how to then, you know, give them something of value that then you can return you know, in terms of money. And I thought that was really smart. And, and um, I really, I, I, it's something that has definitely this year been reinforced, you know, in terms of kind of how to approach the business as far as the economics. We have, I don't see the microphone, I'm sorry. Let me just say one thing in response to that last question, too, which is that I think the artist, and, and you were just talking about engaging with the, the graphics person, the venue owner, the promoter, that kind of thing. Typically, that's the kind of stuff managers do. Artists don't get involved in that. Nowadays, more and more DIY. Who needs a manager? You know, do that stuff yourself. But I think you also kind of, as an artist, I think, you might find that you don't necessarily want to be getting to know all those people, that's why you hire a manager. That's why you, you find somebody to do all that stuff for you. So I, I think there, you know, every story is different, every organism and situation is different, but the ones you described um, in, a, in a classical, you know, the, the, the golden years, rock and roll when, when it was a, a different age than now, 
managers got to know all those people. The, the artists might meet the promoter, they might know the promoter, they might even become friends with the promoter. It's not, but it wasn't an important relationship that had to happen every time. Maybe that's changing because now artists are doing more and more of that themselves. I would also add that all of those people just facilitate monetizing the fans. I think that's a I think that's a great point because I've had that. I mean, I just finished a record. It was mastered two weeks ago, and I would never have made it if I hadn't had a studio engineer come to me and say, "I just want you to make a record, and I want you to come to my studio and work for free." And so that was because of work that I've done in the past. That's because of my relationship with him and that community. And I was very fortunate that I have a couple other engineers who worked on the record who are letting me wait to pay them until <laughs> I make money from my record, which we'll see if that happens or from other things. But I think that it points to a, 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 something that's coming up a lot in the conference for me is the larger ecosystem and the ecosystem of community and the ecosystem of like different facets and that we have to work as different facets and, center, and kind of synchronize our, our expertise at this point. And if we can just sort of start working on dispensing with a sort of traditional structure to a certain point and use, and, and basically acknowledge those relationships but realize at the end of the day that we have to pay rent and that people who are, people who are working to monetize things need to make sure that content and, I mean, not to be a broken record, but it's like if everyone is making sure that they can pay their rent, but using things that musicians make and artists make and create and not helping them be sustained, then that's a problem. It, it, I'm just going to jump in on one thing here. and it's, it's something you said before and it ties to this and, and then I'll stop. Um, you had made the point about um, that, and I thought this was a great one, that, you know, it's a, a travel agent doesn't, you know, change, it, it's not as important culturally maybe as a song because you wake up singing that the student said that. Um, we we're talking a lot about make, making money and surviving and we've talked about policy too, but what about like if the arts, if music really is so important to all of us, there's also a sense of is there, does there come a point when we as a people, as a government uh, can, can, you know, speak out and say we need, you know, they're slashing NEA, they're slashing NEH, um, you know, they're, they're programs that could help with jobs and all these sorts of things. And I, I feel that's kind of disappearing from policy talk as, as you know, as far as making a living and yeah. I'll leave it at that. Question up here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I have something to say also about um, to this issue of community among, among musicians. I was for many years a, a program director at a, of a nonprofit arts presenter, but about 10 years ago I began performing and life on the other side of the microphone could not be more, more different. Um, one, I heard a very persuasive talk about uh, a year or so ago that guitarist Mark Rebo, who you might know as a great activist, organized something at the Brecht Forum about trying to organize musicians who play in clubs in New York where, you know, it's hard to make a nickel. You, you don't make a nickel. And he brought a gentleman who was a restaurant, uh, who organized restaurant workers and wanted to, he, he pointed out that musicians, we tend to identify uh, personally with people who like the same music as us or have the same politics as us or dress like us or live in our neighborhood and we don't feel a solidarity with a guy who plays salsa music in the Bronx or thrash metal in Staten Island. We don't really see the enterprise <laughs> Um, as, as being the same for all of us. And so if I try to make a stand and say, I won't play in this club if you're only going to pay me $25, there's 500 bands lined up behind me that are going to take the, the, the $25. So it's very hard to organize um, for a living wage when we're undercutting ourselves because we don't see ourselves as all part of one huge community making music. And I wonder, this is my first time to this conference, I've learned so much, my head is spinning. But I, I, I wonder if this might not become uh, part of the effort to just to, um, to ask musicians to, to look at themselves as musicians in a very broad sense. That we might accomplish more if we saw our community as, a, as large as it could be. Um, if I could address that for a quick say, it's Mark Rebo, the guitarist you're talking about? Yeah, he, he did organize the uh, musicians in New York about a certain festival. 
and uh, sent petitions around. So he became an activist in that particular field. I think it's this larger notion that an artist needs to see themselves not only someone who produces uh, an art form and culture and, and, and participates in the fabric of what's going on outside of nuts and bolts, but see themselves individually as entrepreneurs with rights that need to be respected and can stand up and do things. We've touched upon that. And I think that's what you're, you're enlightened by, that maybe there's other powers and other places you can go with your music and that people will listen. But like all of us here, you can't do it alone. And, and you, you should be your own activist and you're gonna find there's gonna be a lot of people stand behind you. But, but someone needs to lead and that's, uh, you know, lead from your own example. Um, I just wanted to make a really quick comment um, before um, you were talking about education and students and optimism. And I just wanted to say um, I'm a senior music industry student at Drexel and um, Marcy Wagman told me about this, the Future Music Policy Summit when I was a freshman and I've been coming to these events like ever since. This is my third policy summit. And I just wanted to say that like these like you all and all the speakers have really touched students. I mean, it's definitely touched me. And you know, certain professors will speak. I mean, Anna, you were speaking about like telling your students how invaluable coming to this is, and it's true. And I just wanted to speak as a student that it truly has been. And coming to coming to this event has really shaped my four years in college. And I'm sad. I'm not going to have the student discount after this year. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe <laughs> we can work something out. Hint. Young um, alumni discount. <laughs> but I just wanted to say, like, truly, as a student, you have inspired me, and I'm sure you've inspired a lot of other students. And even touching on community, a lot of my friends back in Philadelphia ask me what I learn at these events. And like, I'm tweeting the whole time and texting my friends what I learn. And, you know, they tweet me back. I had a friend that tweeted me back, like, I really want to sit down with you when, when you come home. Like, I want to know what you learned about. And um, I was telling my friend about the, the DC Local Music Day. They're like, what can we do to have this in Philly? Like, how do you write a proposal for this? And I just, I just wanted to let you all know and everybody who's involved know that you, like, you really have been having an impact on students and the future of the music industry. Like, I just hope that I can pass like, what I've learned from you all on to the next generation after me that wants to be doing this. But there is hope, and I do have optimism, and so thank you for, for keeping that alive. Thank you. Well, I think one way to get into this event for free is to intern for Future Music, which is what I've been doing since June. I'm Danny, and as a 22-year-old recent college grad, um, a lover of music and a Spotify subscriber, and I've worked with Chris and Renee on DC Local Music Day, actually. Um, I have to say that it's, as a user, um, having everything, we talked about everything all the time, as, that is a phenomenon. And as somebody who loves music and loves culture and literature, it's pretty overwhelming to have all of human history's uh, creative content on your desk next to your bed. And, you know, it can be hard to sleep at night knowing <laughs> that there's no excuse not to know it. Um, so I guess my question in, in, from a music angle is, do you take that into account? Because it's very hard to, it's very hard for me to now to have that unique relationship with an artist by going to, you know, a record store and, and purchasing a CD or you know purchasing vinyl. Um, are you making any efforts on behalf of your artists or um, as artists to really you know close the gap because it feels like that has expanded since the time I was 17 or 18. I'd love to flip that question on you as a as a oh, give, music give fan, give, yeah, <laughs> give, give it back. and say, you know, what are what are you looking for in terms of deepening that relationship? Like, this is your opportunity to mentor us because I I think that you know we could use your feedback because all we're doing is um, taking guesses at what you know or or getting as much feedback as we can from fans, but you know, thinking about what they might want. And conjecturing is one thing, but like, t you t tell me. 
Well, I moved to DC to start with FMC in June, and I heard about DC Local Music Day, and that's uh, essentially the reason I got involved, was to become closer to these artists and these communities, and be able to put a face with a name and a track and all that, all that jazz. And um, I, I guess, I don't know, the, 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 we talked about this last year at the conference, was that you know, creative ways to engage fans in terms of, um, there was an example from last year of going to a fan's house to cook dinner, which is, you know, which is extreme, but um, things like that and innovative packaging and that kind of stuff has been, has been, has been really nice. And, you know, um, all the metadata that's been involved in, um, in these small files has actually been, has been really cool as well. And the stuff Bjork's doing with the iPad app and um, all that has been really helpful. Um, but I'm in the same place as all of you, I guess. You know, you know I, I think back to you know being a music fan as, as a teenager compared to sort of what the opportunities are for you all now. It, it looks to me like there is much more opportunity for you to have a closer relationship with the artist now than there was for me, you yeah. know? I, you know, I, I was a huge fan of Public Enemy. I, I had, you know, the closest I could get to them was I would go to the Fresh Fest and they were on stage, like, you know, like seemed like miles away from me. Yeah. But now, like, Chuck D is on Twitter, and if you tweet him at his, his name, he might respond to you. Like, I had no opportunity for that. You know what I mean? So it's, to me, it seems like there's a lot more ability to have a personal connection with, uh, with your idols and your artists now with, with all of these things like YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that than there were before. I kind of have a question about going back to what the fans want. Um, having been in the industry both digitally and physically for a long time, I kind of find it interesting that we are all kind of talking at the fans. And I was really reminded about that when I was at the Nashville uh, Country Music Summit. And when you hear the Nashville artists talk about how they build relationships with fans, they're second only to NASCAR. And one of the things that I got from that is that we're telling the fans what to do as opposed to giving them it however they want it. I mean, the technology that allows the amazing things to happen digitally would also allow a hyper-local distribution strategy. And that be, is more physically tenable for the DYIs and for the stores than thinking that everything has got to be a national artist. So we have to get back down to local and maybe using more clicks to figure out where those bricks or those shows should be would be the biggest help that the digital people could end up giving to the artist and to the business that is still important to get it out the door. Can I say one? I mean, one of the things, and I'm, well, I confess to having joined the REM fan club at one point. <laughs> um, we just closed it down. <laughs> that's okay, I've been off the list for a while. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, this is something that, to, just to use it as a reference, but Michael used it, had talked about early days, and it was something that I really liked as a fan of the band. And I think it's something that is, I know it's something that translates through all genres and all communities, is that there's an element of making a space together between a musician and a listener. And you can say fan and maker or whatever, but when you're performing, when, when I'll speak for myself, when I'm performing live, there's about the space of the room, there's the energy, there's who's in the room, like there's, there's, a, there's an unnameable, unspeakable place that, that, is, that, that is because of those two forces or those thousand people or communities. And I think when music is at its best, for me personally, there's that mystery and there's that element of the unnameable. There's, that, that, there's all those different stories colliding. I mean, I had a great moment when I was South by Southwest and, and Oza Motley and Josh Coon did this amazing presentation talking about sort of their history through music and just and like, bam, in half an hour. It was incredible. And it was just this a really good example, I think, of what happens when people bring their stories into the same space and how, how we relate. So I think as much as we can say, oh, yeah, you know, you can tweet Chuck D, and Chuck D will be like, yeah, man, that's a cool idea, or hey, you should check out this, which I think is amazing, that's where we're at. I think it's also important to always leave that openness and, and give, give music that mystery and history and, and power, too. And 
And maybe sometimes say things that, that you that take more than a tweet. I mean, I think sometimes tweet, you can, it's a quick back and forth, but is it really a conversation? Yeah, I just wanted to respond somewhat to what you said, because Mark's a, a member of the New York local, and we've talked about what he's doing there, and they have had some successes. What I talked about earlier is a different approach to trying to organize, but organizing musicians is hard. We've been at it for 115 years, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's hard work. Um, but, but the actual comment I wanted to make, maybe get a response, is that whenever we talk about monetization, it always has this undercurrent of it's evil or it's bad for musicians to want to do it. I think of it in terms of freedom to do what you want to do, to be able to create the art. And I was struck uh, this week by a, one of our local artists in town that is releasing their fourth record, CD, they're, they're not an emerging artist, they're an artist. And they're gonna finally go for it. And part of the reason they want it, they're gonna finally do it, is they can't take seeing their fans in the morning following a concert in a major venue, serving them coffee or some such thing. They just can't make it, they can't do that anymore. This, the making of money is the freedom for them to go out and do their art, and it's critical. It's about respect. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything evil at all about artists yeah. making money. I think it's... Well, it's yeah. 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 But I think you said it right. You know, it's it's the freedom. If you do have the opportunity to monetize your art, it gives you the ability to make more of it. I think you have to decide if you want to be a suffering artist or a working artist. Yeah, it really comes down to it. It's a mindset, and you're right. That's and it's all. Not you just deciding either. Yeah. No, it's not you deciding. Yeah, people deciding for you. I just wanted to add a few comments on the artist um, fan relation. I'm working as a jazz artist and it's become tradition for jazz artists to kind of be mysterious and you know you do what you do but don't expect anybody to understand what you do and I learned more and more over the years or the feedback that I'm getting and I'm touring a lot is well, what I do when I perform I, I give people the story I, I tell them where, where this why I wrote this tune where it came from and what we're gonna do and I always get the feedback that they so appreciate me letting them in in the process. And I'm experimenting some more with it and finding that, that that's working. On the last release, I didn't only do put out another CD that becomes a coaster in my basement, but <laughs> I added a, a documentary with it, you know, showing, okay, this is, this is what I do and what it's all about. And, and the next step that I'm trying to do, and not, it's an experiment, but maybe some other will be in that too, we'll see, is going for a solo piano project, but again, not just putting out another coaster, but trying to document the process, you know, this, this, is, this is the score that goes with it, and I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna work on this tune and, and let people in and being filmed in the studio and making it kind of a multimedia production that you can put in the computer. But just experimenting with how, how can I let people in in what I do. And I think sometimes the artists don't think enough that, of course, you do arts for art's sake and you want to get it out. But there is that relationship and it's a two-way street. And maybe we need sometimes a bit more education for the artists too, how to actually let people in and not close it off. We're going to make this the last question, then we're going to move on to the um, next thing. But go ahead. Hi there. Uh, question about uh, the distinction between Wall Street owned entities and local businesses. Uh, I was speaking with Aaron last night actually about power structures. And one thing I think uh, is very important to distinguish is the difference between Wall Street owned firms which obviously own the labels and which obviously own a lot of the big players in the music industry today and some of the local businesses that are trying to support music. Um, any, this is for anyone on the panel. Do you all draw a distinction between these two groups? Because the first group 
in, in other words, the short-term profit maximizers, is really the antithesis of creativity. And I don't think that if we continue to support these companies, whether it's venture capital backed, was just an extension of Wall Street, or public, publicly traded companies, that we will ever really see a sustainable music industry. Can anyone comment on perhaps our manager friend here, if, if you try to guide your artist towards partnering up, whether it's co-branding with more sustainable businesses, because now that corporations have a lot more money in their coffers, they're obviously starting to filter into the underground music scene. Um, does anyone want to comment on that? I'm not sure I follow your, what's your question? Okay, the, sorry. My, my question is more, more and more we're seeing a link between artists and yeah. brands. Yeah. Is there a distinction drawn at all between linking up with brands that are owned by Wall Street, which is any publicly traded company, mm -hmm. versus linking up with brands that are not owned by Wall Street, which is a more sustainable, not necessarily short-term profit motivated only? Well, I mean, the distinction is that brands that tend to not be owned by Wall Street can't afford to link up with an artist in a monetized way. So it's a partnership and a friendship, which we do all the time. You know, if, if um, someone started a shoe company in LA and they want to get their shoes out there and they want to give one of my band's shoes to wear on stage, like, of course we'll do that, you know. But if, um, a, I don't know, Nike or Adidas wants to sponsor a tour, then that's about money. So I think it just depends on, is that answering your question? I mean, yeah, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit disheartened to see, particularly in the underground music scene, the, mm -hmm. the acceptance of, sure, let's bring in Corporation X, Y, and Z because, you know, we want a bigger tour. Mm -hmm. But inherent in that is you're supporting the same power structure that more or mm -hmm. less took down the economy in 08. Mm -hmm. And these kinds of things, I think a lot of that conversation is lost. And there won't be a sustainable industry if Wall Street controls the new music industry. It depends on what you're talking about control. If they're actually going to control the creative process of the artist, you're absolutely right. If we go back to the other gentleman that says that money equals freedom and the corporations are giving the bands the freedom to do what they want, they've actually done the bands a great dis uh, service. Yeah. So you think they're doing the bands a favor and they're not trying to strengthen their own brand or their own... Well, it's a quid pro quo. They're not going to give money just for nothing. But yeah. what I'm saying, it doesn't mean that the band is, is now enslaved to that corporation. We're talking about uh, the need today in the, in the music business to seek out these multiple revenue streams. And that becomes a very interesting one. It used to be 20 years ago, it was the kiss of death. I can't imagine R.E.M. ever accepting a corporate sponsor. But today, it's like, hey, there's money there. Let's go take it. It doesn't mean that we marry these people. It doesn't mean we live by them. We don't even have to talk about them. But they're giving us money that we can't get anywhere else. If you can do the separation, you're fine. And I think that one of the things is that I think just the conversation around it is really lacking. And I think that I, think that I don't really, I think having all options open is super important, like for exactly what Peter talked about and what people are talking about. But I think that there's not, there's not much conversation, there's not much vocabulary about what that means cultural, what are the implications of that, what are the long-term political and, and resource implications of that. Uh, and you know, there, it's, there's so much information coming out of the same box. You know, punk is coming out of the same box as, as Wall Street, as Bank of America, it's all coming out of the computer. And I think there's a, there's a lot to be done in terms of developing ways of looking at that and having media awareness and consumer awareness and what that means when musicians say, like I'm hoping that if someone came to me and was like, hey, you know, uh, you love drinking this and this and this, we want to give you $75,000 so that you can do this and this and this, I would, I would definitely, I'm sure, no one else is walking up, but can I find a way to talk about that, why, what that means, and I think that's something that everybody needs to contribute and start. I think there's a lot of work to be done in that. Um, first of all, thank you to the panel. It was really a great conversation and, and great way to wrap it up. Thank you to the audience.